Hey y'all, thank you for tuning in today. Let's go ahead and watch this beautiful scenery today. As we're reading Jim Butcher's Proven Guilty. This is chapter 12. So if you've missed those other chapters or you've missed the uh, previous books, do go ahead and look down in their playlists below. But let me go ahead here and jump right into chapter 12. And while I do, make sure to like, subscribe, and share this channel with others. It, and leave your comments down below, because feedback or any comments is definitely something that I look at and try to uh, keep up with. So let's go ahead here while you grab your books and we'll jump into chapter 12. No more than two or three seconds went before Rawlings had his flashlight out and he flicked it on. The light flashed white and clean for maybe half a second, and then it dimmed down, as though some kind of greasy soot had coated it, until the light, though still bright, was so vague and veiled that it accomplished little more than to cast a faint glow to maybe an arm's length from Rollins. What the hell? he said, and shook the light a few times. He had his hand on his gun, the restraining strap off, but he hadn't drawn it yet. Good man. He knew as well as I did that the hotel was going to have far more panicked attendees than potential threats. We'll try mine, I said, and got the silver pentacle on its chain from around my neck. A gentle whisper and an effort of will, and the amulet began to emit a pure silver blue light that reached into the darkness around us burning it away as swiftly as it pressed in, until we could see maybe fifteen feet around us. Beyond that was just a murky vagueness, not so much a cloud or a mist, a simple lack of light. I gripped my staff in my right hand, and more of my will thrummed through it, setting the winding spirals of runes and sigils along its length to burning with a gentle ember-orange light. Rawlings stared at me for a second and then said, What the hell is going on? There were running footsteps and shouts and cries in the gloom. All of them sounded choked, muffled somehow. One of the two teenaged vampires stumbled into the circle of my azure wizard's light, sobbing. Several younger men blundered along a moment later, blindly, and all but trampled her. Rawlings grabbed the girl with a grunt of, excuse me, miss, and hauled her from their path. He lifted her more or less by main strength and pushed her gently against the wall. He forced her to look at him and said, follow the wall, that way to the door, stay close to the wall until you get out. She nodded, tears making her makeup run in a mascara mudslide, and stumbled off, following Rollins' directions. Fire? Rollins blurted, turning back to me. Is this... Is this smoke? No, I said. Believe me, I know burning buildings. He gave me an odd look, grabbed an older woman who was passing blindly, and set her off to follow the wall to the door out. He shivered then, and when he exhaled, his breath came out in a long, frosty plume. The temperature had dropped maybe 40 degrees in the space of a minute. I struggled to ignore the sounds of frightened people in the dark, and focused on my magical senses. I reached out to the cold and the gloom. I found it vaguely familiar kind of spellworking, though I couldn't remember precisely where I'd encountered it before. I spun in a slow circle with my eyes closed, and felt the murk grow deeper, darker, as I faced back down the hall to the hotel's front desk. I took a step that way, and the murk th thickened marginally. The spell source had to be that way. I gritted my teeth and started forward. Hey, Rollins said. Where are you going? Our bad guy is this way, I said. Or something is. Maybe you better stay here. Help get those people out safely. Maybe you ought to shut your foul mouth, Rollins replied, his tone one of forced cheer. He looked scared, but he drew his gun and kept the barrel down close to his side, and held his mostly useless flashlight in his other hand. I'll cover you. I nodded once at him, turned, and plunged into the darkness, Rollins at my back. 
Screams erupted around us, sometimes accompanied by the sight of stumbling, terrified people. Rollins nudged them toward the walls, barked at them in a tone of pure parental authority to stay near them, to move carefully for the exits. The gloom began to press in closer to me, and it became an effort of will to hold up the light in my amulet against it. A few steps more and the air grew even colder. Walking forward became an effort, like wading through waist-deep water. I had to lean against it. I had heard a grunt of effort come out of my mouth. What's wrong? Rollins asked, his voice tight. We passed under one of the hotel's emergency light fixtures, its floodlights only dim orange rings in the murk until my amulet's light burned the shadows away. Dark magic, I growled through clenched teeth, a kind of ward, trying to keep me from moving ahead. He huffed out a breath and muttered, Christ, magic, this isn't real. I stopped and gave him a steady look over my shoulder. Are you with me or not? He swallowed, staring up at the dim circles of light that were all he could see of another set of emergency lights. Crap, he muttered, wiping a sudden bead of sweat from his brow despite the cold air. You need me to push you or something? I let out a bark of tense laughter and forced my power harder against the gloomy ward, hacking at it with a machete of will, until I began to chop a path through the dark working, picking up speed. As I did, the sense of the spell became more clear to me. It's coming from up ahead of us, I said. The first conference room in this hall. They got it set up for movies, Rollins said. He sized a sobbing and terrified man in his middle years and deflected him bodily to the wall, snapping the same orders to him. God, it was packed in there. If the crowd panicked, he didn't finish the sentence. He didn't need to. Chicago has seen more than a few deaths due to sudden panic in a movie theater. I redoubled my efforts and broke into a heavy, labored jog that led us to a pair of doors leading into the first conference room. One of the doors was shut. The other had been slammed open so hard that it had wrenched its way clear of one of the hinges. From inside the room came a sudden burst of terrified screams. Not the canned screams you get in a horror movie. Real screams. Screams of such base, feral intensity that you could hardly tell they had come from a human throat. Screams you only really hear when there are terrible things happening. Rollins knew what they meant. He spat out a low curse, lifting his gun to a ready position, and we rushed forward to the room side by side. The merc began to do more than simply drag at me when I hit the doorway. The air almost seemed to congeal into a kind of gelatin, and it suddenly became a fight to keep my legs moving forward. I snarled in sudden frustration and transformed it into a more will that I sent coursing down through my silver pentacle amulet. The soft radiance emitting from the symbol became a white and cobalt floodlight, driving back the gloom, burning it from my path. I left the large room still coated in shadow, and it was no longer the total occlusion of the magical murk. It was a long room, about sixty feet, maybe half that wide. At the far end of the room was a large projector screen. Chairs faced it in two columns. At one point in the aisle between them, the projector sat, running at such a frantic speed that smoke was rising from the reels of celluloid. The projector movie still appeared clearly on the screen, and a frantic, fast-motion blur of faces and images from a classic horror film from the early 80s. The soundtrack could only be heard as a single, long, piercing howl. There were still about twenty people in the room. Immediately beside the door was an old woman, curled on her side on the ground, sobbing in pain. Nearby, a wheelchair lay overturned, and a man with braces of some kind on his legs and hips had fallen into an awkward, painful-looking spiral from which he could not arise. One of his arms was visibly broken, bone pushing its skin. Other people cringed against the walls and beneath chairs. 
When my wizard light flooded the place, they got up and started staggering away, still screaming in horror. Straight ahead of me were bodies and bloodied. I couldn't see much of them. Three people were down. There was a lot of blood around. A fourth person, a young woman, crawled toward the door, making frantic, mewling sounds. A man stood over her. He was nearly seven feet tall and so thick with slabs of muscle that he almost seemed deformed. Not pretty bodybuilder muscle either, but the thick, dull slabs that come from endless physical labor. He wore overalls, a blue shirt, and a hockey mask, and there was a long, curved sickle in his right hand. As I watched, he took a pair of long steps forward, seized the whimpering girl by her hair, and jerked her body into a backward bow. He raised the sickle in his right hand. Rollins didn't bother to offer him a chance to surrender. He took a stance not ten feet away, aimed, and put three shots into the masked maniac's head. The man jerked, twisting a bit, and released the girl's hair abruptly, tossing her aside with a terrible, casual strength. She hit a row of chairs and let out a cry of pain. Then the maniac turned toward Rollins and, even though the mask hid his features, the tilt of his head and the tension of his posture showed that he was furious. He went towards Rollins. The cop shot him four more times, flashes of bright white burning the image of the maniac and the room into my eyes. He brought the sickle down on Rollins. The cop managed to catch the force of it along his flashlight. Sparks flew from the steel case, but the light held. The maniac twisted the sickle so that the tip plowed a furrow across Rollins' forearm. The cop snarled. The flashlight spun to the ground. The maniac raised the sickle again. I braced myself, raised my staff and my will, and cried, FULZARE! Unseen power lashed from my staff, ripped through the air, and hit the maniac like a wrecking ball. The blow drove him back down the aisle, through the air, he hit the projector on its stand. It shattered. He went through it without slowing down. He kept going, the flight of his passage tearing through the large projector screen and hit the back wall with a thunderous impact. I sagged in sudden exhaustion. The effort of the spell, an enormous drain on me, and had to plant my staff on the ground to keep from falling over. My headache flared with a vengeance, and the light of my amulet and staff both faded. There were a few more screams. The quick light sounded of frightened feet, and I whirled. I saw someone flee the room from the corner of my eye, but I didn't get much of a look at them. A second later, the room returned to normal. The lights back, the broken projector still spinning one reel at reduced speed. A loose tongue of film slap slap slapping the broken casing. Rollins advanced gun still out, his eyes very wide. Down from the far end of the room, he went past the screen and looked behind it, gun in firing position. He looked around for a second, then back at me, his expression baffled. He's not here, Rollins said. Did you see him go that way? I just didn't have enough left in me to speak right at that moment. I shook my head. There's a dent in the wall, he reported, covered in, uh, I don't know what, some kind of slime? He's gone, I grunted. Then I started forward toward the downed people. Two of them were young men, the third a young woman. Help me. Rollins holstered his weapon and did. None of the young men were dead. And there was a crescent-shaped cut in his thigh that had opened an artery. Another lay merciful. Uh, mercifully unconscious, a bruise on his head. Several hideous inches of bloody innards protruding from a slash across his belly. I was afraid that if we moved him, his guts might come popping out. The girl was alive, but the sickle's tip had drawn a pair of long lines down her back along the spine, and the cuts had been vicious and deep. Bits of bone showed, and she lay on her belly, her eyes open and blinking, but utterly unfocused, either unwilling or unable to move any. 
We did what we could for them, which wasn't much more than jerking the tablecloths off the water tables on the corner and improvising soft pads out of them to apply to open wounds. The second girl lay on her side, nearby, sobbing hysterically. I checked on the old woman, who had just had the wind knocked out of her. I hauled the guy who had fallen from his wheelchair into a slightly more comfortable position, and he nodded his thanks to me. See to the other victim, Rollins said. He held the pad against the boy's open abdomen, putting gentle pressure on it as he jerked out his radio. It squealed with feedback and static when he used it, but he managed to get emergency help headed our way. I went to the sobbing girl, a tiny little brunette wearing much of the same clothes as Molly's had been. She'd been bruised up pretty well, and from the way she lay on the floor, she could evidently not move without feeling agony. I went to her and felt over her left shoulder gently. Be still, I told her quietly. It's your collarbone, I think. I know it hurts like hell, but you're going to be all right. It hurts. It hurts, 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 she panted. I found her hand with mine and squeezed tight. She returned it with desperate pressure. You'll be all right, I told her. Don't leave me, she whimpered. Her hand was all but crushing mine. Don't leave me. It's all right, I said. I'm right here. What the hell is this? Rawlings said, panting. He looked around him, at the corpse, at the movie screen, at the dent in the wall beyond. That was the Reaper. The freaking Reaper from the Sunburn Slasher films. What kind of psycho dresses up as the Reaper and starts his face twisted in sudden nausea? What the hell is this? Rawlings, I said in a sharp voice, to get his attention. His frightened eyes darted toward me. Call Murphy, I told him. He stared at me blankly for a second and then said, My captain is the one who has to make the call on that one. He'll decide. Up to you, I said. But Murphy and her boys might actually be able to do something with this. Your captain can't. I nodded at the corpse, and we aren't playing for pennies here. Rollins looked at me, then at the dead boy. Then he nodded once and picked up his radio again. Hurts, the girl whimpered, breathless with pain. Hurts, hurts, hurts. I held her hand. I patted it awkwardly with my gloved left hand while we heard sirens approach. My God, Rawlings said. He shook his head. My God, Dresden, what happened here? I stared at the enormous rip in the movie screen and at the reaper-shaped dent in the wooden panels of the wall behind it. Clear gelatin. The physical form of ectoplasm. The matter of the spirit world. Gleamed there against the broken wood. In minutes it would evaporate, and there would be nothing left behind. My God, Rawlings whispered again, his voice still stunned. What happened here? Thank you for listening to chapter 12 with me. Stay tuned for the rest of the chapters. I want to thank you guys very much for being with this channel, helping this channel along, listening and reading along with me. You all have a wonderful, wonderful and blessed day. And thank you again for sharing.